Okay, I think it's time to start our section. This is a panel on AI in 2027. So we're going to look at the future, but not the very, very, very distant future. So we'll see if we can, if our experts are going to be right or wrong. At least in 10 years, you should be able to check, right? So um, let's just try to go through quickly, see if I can control this forward. Okay, so, um, so the panels we have here today, I'm Maria Gini, I'm from the University of Minnesota in the US. We have four panel members, they all come from different places with different backgrounds to try to get as much diversity as possible. So Noah Agmon from bar -Ilan University in Israel, she's an expert in autonomous agents, robotics, uh, and some theoretical applications of different applications of, of robotics and again, agents. Fausto Giunchiglia from the University of Trento in Italy. He's an expert in uh, knowledge presentation, in particular in uh, logic-based representation, plus much more. I'm going to be short because I don't want to take all the time to tell you how good those people are. Uh, then we have Kevin Leighton Brown. Oh, I, I failed alphabetical order, sorry. Uh, <laughs> University of British Columbia, expert in game theory, author of a textbook on game theory, made the US government make millions of dollars recently, right? By selling a Spectrum auction, so very famous for that. And uh, Sven Koenig, University of Southern California, is an uh, expert in uh, AI, in games, uh, in search algorithms, in robotics. Uh, he's also the chair of the ACM SIG AI, which is a special interest group in AI. And one of the many things we like to do after the panel today is to get each of them is going to write a short notes on what they discuss is going to be published in the SIG AI newsletters. So 10 years from now, we can go back and see, you know, whatever they said, was it right or not or wrong. Now, um, I asked them two questions. The idea is they will tell you their opinions, and then we have lots of time for questions from the audience. We really like. So the first question I say, now it's 2027. So what do you expect of the AI technology to be in common daily use? Uh, what things that today look very potentially, very valid, very good, will still be just showing potential, or will the potential be delivered? Uh, and the second question is, in 2027, we're going to be again, all of us at each guy, right? Uh, and the question is, if I have to, if we have to predict what will be the topics most popular? If you look at the conference this year, there are a number of titles for the sections. What will those be in 10 years from now? Uh, and what will be invited talks? What will be cutting edge research? So hopefully this will give you a little bit of start. They will share their ideas on those, uh, on these questions. And again, then we'll open for discussion. So we go in alphabetical, partial alphabetical order, my mistake. So we start with, uh, oops, okay, okay. Noah, your slide will show up there by magic, I think. Yes, magic. Oh, cool. Um, okay, so I was asked to talk about AI and HKI in 10 years, what's gonna be um, happening. Uh, so I can humbly say that I don't actually know, or I can just, uh, um, well, give a, a, an educated guess on what it, what's going to happen in 10 years. I'm certainly not going to talk about general AI, but on robotics, which is uh, one of the things that I know uh, a bit better. So looking at ro robotic research, or uh, robotic research especially from the AI perspective, uh, we're actually now in 2027. I mean, we look at uh, the drones of Vijay Kumar, we see the cobots, we see the kilobots, and uh, Valkyrie of NASA. And actually, the, the robotic research is, is uh, I mean, it's just, you, it's just amazing. The problem is that in reality, robots are not used. And this is today. If we're looking at, I mean, you can say, well, robots are used because you have your iRobot Roomba. Uh, there are uh, um, pool cleaning robots, uh, robots on Mars. Um, so I tried to understand where robots are indeed used 
and I think uh, that there are three categories for that. One is for non-critical tasks, uh, for example, cleaning your house. If you come home and you see that uh, your Roomba was stuck, uh, you can just take it out and clean your house yourself or just um, let it run again. If you are using or if robots are used for critical tasks, uh, for example, exploring Mars or uh, in military applications, then there are not, they are not autonomous. There is always someone in the loop telling it what to do. Or the last case is in a very structured setting uh, where there is no uncertainty. For example, uh, the Amazon robotics. So everything is known, the, the environment is closed, and robots behave perfectly. So why, not, so why robots are not found everywhere? Bottom line is because robots are unreliable. It's either because of the robots themselves or because the environment poses some challenges to the robot that they cannot handle. Just one very brief example, perhaps you know Steve. Uh, Steve is a security robot uh, made from Nightscope, um, a company. And Steve was in the news about a month ago after it was reported that it committed suicide on its first day in the job where it uh, patrolled uh, for security um, in Washington. Okay, they even made a memorial for, oops, sorry. They even, uh, yeah, this is a memorial for Steve. Um, the reason Steve committed suicide, or the, the reason that it jumped into the pool, was because it slipped on the floor, okay? The floor was slippery. So, if we want to use robots, we have, if we want to use robots commonly, what we have to do is to overcome many realistic challenges. Uh, we cannot control the environment because uh, slippery floors will be there actually forever. Uh, but we can try to control how the robots react in these settings. So we have to overcome challenges in hardware. Uh, for example, communication, energy, as long as uh, uh, drones can operate only 20 minutes in the air, they cannot be used in critical missions. Sensing. I mean, I want to sense this slippery floor so my robot will not jump to, into the pool. Uh, this is not only engineering problem, there are also biology and chemistry in that, making better materials. And on the other side, there's a software that has to handle these uncertainties a lot better. Again, either the uncertainty in the behavior of the robot or uncertainty in the world. So in 2027, uh, robots will benefit from all AI advances that my colleagues were, will probably talk about. Uh, NLP, image processing, machine learning, and so on. Also, if we'll be able to overcome all these hardware challenges, uh, it, well, we'll see more and more robots in the world. I'm not too optimistic. I mean, I don't think that everything will be solved. I don't think that we'll have perfect sensing, unlimited energy, uh, but gradually we're getting better and better in that. Um, still, we'll need people in the loop. So we'll have more human robot collaboration, uh, not only in assistive robotics, but also in teams of robots and in autonomy. You won't need to have one human per robot in critical missions. You perhaps could have one person handling 20 or 30 or 50 robots. Um, and it could be remotely because communication will be better. Uh, and the robots will be semi-autonomous uh, or almost completely autonomous, but not entirely. Um, we'll see robots are of different sizes and materials. The best example I have is the nanobots. Uh, these nice uh, structures made of, uh, this is one example, made of DNA origami. So we can have robots traveling inside our blood, curing all sorts of illnesses. Uh, and this we can start seeing now, uh, but we'll probably see it more commonly in 10 years. And last, Ichikai, 
or AI research will bring, will have to handle more, to bring inside more disciplines. For example, natural science, if we're talking about uh, these uh, nice nanobots, or social science, if we're talking about humans and, and robots. Um, so that's my two cents. So, I push a button. No. So, I was told to be provocative. I hope I'm not going to be too provocative. So, uh, I was thinking of a title for, we should set a goal for 2027. And uh, since now everything, Google does everything and everything is done online. So, the question is is there one thing that Google cannot do? and that we may hope to do with AI technology in 2027? That's the question. And let me just say what I think is a means for doing this, which is, um, and by the way, we start seeing some of this in EGKI in many other conferences. So what I'm saying is, is uh, some last piece, but also a kind of, um, we start seeing some of this in, in, in EGKI, and I hope that this talk of mine is gonna actually provoke more of this kind of line of research. So I believe that, uh, um, clearly, we have to decide what it means to go being online more than we are now online, but if there is a solution, I think it's going to be at the intersection of the current AI technologies. I think that we have already been a KR person, have, have improved a lot of theorems in my life. I think that in KR, we already have a lot of technology. In machine learning, there's already a lot of technology. Uh, agents have done work in age, there's already a lot of technology. I think that either is a future in 2027 for AI, for this community to have an impact, is by putting these technologies together. Because you see, there's a fundamental principle. These technologies don't, don't compose. At the current stage of the art, it's not the case that you just take AI, AI reason and you put it together with machine learning reason and they work. They don't work. The boundary between these disciplines is tough. And to me, the only way to think about uh, how to put these technologies together, because each of them require a lot of know-how, is to think of a concrete problem that we can solve, that right now we cannot solve, and see how we can use it using different technologies. So here, yeah, here is my take, if I know how to do it. How it works. Okay, next slide. So, 2013, I thought my problem is rare disease problems. The rare diseases are very interesting problems. See, a rare disease is so rare that you don't even know that you have it. Um, and uh, in Europe, and I think in Europe we are not in a bad position, we, we don't know how to fix them. You can say it's a problem of economical problem, all the usual arguments, ethical arguments, but I think one reason why we don't solve, we don't have it solved is because it's very, very hard. Why it is hard? Or you can say because there is not much, enough knowledge. Because, uh, you see, there, there is a rare disease, uh, which I discovered, uh, that uh, the only way to, to realize you have that rare disease is to see how you move your fingers. If you move your fingers in a certain way, this means you have that rare disease. How do you know? You have no clue. And you see, I don't think that for solving the rare disease problem is only a problem of sparsity of knowledge. I think there is much deeper. I think the rare disease problem is actually a clear problem, which is a manifesto, which is actually evidence of the fundamental problem of knowledge. So, what is a fundamental problem of knowledge? What is the main limitation to our knowledge reasoning, knowledge system, even including machine learning, not only the KR people like me? It's as follows. So, you see, the big problem is that we don't know what we don't know. And machine learning techniques, you can learn as much as you want, you can build your machine learning, as much, your neural network as big as you want, but it's, how does it know what it doesn't know? And you see, if you think about it, uh, there are two things to say. Uh, uh, number one, we are very bad at this as humans because we all think that we know everything and then all of a sudden we wake up one day and discover that we know nothing all of a sudden. But at the same time, we are much better than machines. So there's one thing that we humans do much better than machines is a handling the unknown, is surviving, adapting, evolving, like all, all life. And this, I think, is a fundamental property that current machines, and current, even during, I mean, I'm talking deep in neural network to mean 
what now is considered excellence, they are, don't know how to deal with the open, they don't know how to deal with the unknown. So, and by the way, think of, of rare diseases. And now we talk about rare diseases, but you see, if you come to train, to train in the middle of the mountains, they see diseases. The disease you take, you take near the ocean are rare diseases in Trento. And vice versa, if you live near the sea, you, don't not, you know nothing about the disease about the mountains. So it's not a zero one thing, it's that each of us, we all live in our knowledge, be it our experience, our friends, and so on and so forth. And then everything else, we have no clue. We have so not much clue that we don't even know what the other people know. I can't understand anything in robotics. I just, and robotic, what about other areas? So this issue of uh, not knowing what you don't know is fundamental is fundamentally uh, deep in we as humans, something we're very bad at, it's part of our incomplete, and sometimes it's something that machines don't know how to do. Google does not know how to do it. Deep Learn does not know how to do it. So I think this is actually, and by the way, but you start seeing some papers now in Ijikai, and this is also where I think we're gonna hope, hope we're gonna go for 2027. You see paper talking about diversity, open world, where to me open world means uh, being able to, to, not knowing the unknown means that you have programs that at runtime solve problems that, that you didn't have a clue to that they existed when you wrote the machine, you wrote the program. So now, how you solve it? And this me come to the solution part, is my, I have two more slides ago. How do we do it, ourselves as humans? I mean, so here is it interesting. So, so get, get, let's go back to the disease example. When do you, when you have a disease, what do you do? Either you have a doctor, and maybe with a doctor you're okay, but then you need a specialist, and you don't know the specialist. What do you do? You ask around. You make phone calls, at least that's what you do in Italy. And maybe if you live in Milan, always you talk, you talk to a friend, and the best specialist for that disease is in Milan. If you live in Verona, then the best specialist is Verona, which is we all think that the best is all around us. Number one, which shows the incompleteness of their knowledge, but at the same time, shows that um, the social relations, the way people interact together is the way we, we land with the unknown. We get together, we are social animals. Being social is our main power as humans. And I believe, and by the way, there are robots in this picture that smart homes and everything. I'm not saying that we don't need them. I'm just saying there is a huge area of research. And you see some of these in the agent, in the agent community, humans and the robots, and humans and machines or even in knowledge representation. But uh, I think the fundamental headline for me is that uh, where we, we should go, where we are going more or less unconscious, that uh, we should go for programs that do not substitute people, but programs and machines which empower people to do better relations. By the way, if you think of Uber, uh, Facebook, it's all about virtualizing space and time, right? If you think why all, all this Web 2.0 stuff, it's virtualizing space and time going beyond the human limitations. I think we can do much more. This is, I think that being able to help machine, to make machines help us in, this not, in our way of dealing with the unknown by asking who knows. Because this is the bottom line, you see, because we know nothing, but each of us, we know something that the other people don't know. So now that if you have a problem, when you come to a village, or you come to a place, never been to that place, what if you got the right place to the right person to give you exactly what that one thing you need is can be can be taken that one place so social relations and by the way it's very important that you see some of it in agents you see it in kr machine learning of course you have to understand about people and this this now when you get into this now the question is how do you do what i think could be in 2027 I, uh, in the in the aging community machine learning community kr community put together, because you see, I think we know enough in KR, or I think we know enough in machine learning, I think we know in agent technology, to put them together. And I think that coming up with these problems, we come up with totally different problems, totally different ways of thinking of these technologies, reusing what you're doing, but the borderline, as I said, the boundary between these technology is gonna be where the research is gonna be. So how do we the online empower social relations? So there's some interesting organization. First of all, people are not, in, are not interchangeable. And by the way, <laughs> we, we spend years talking to our friends. Some friends are friends, some friends are enemies because we get along with them better or worse. And sometimes we know that we don't want to talk to them. We need to understand, we need to adapt to people, to the context. So it's not machine learning from principles, it's not offline training, it's adapting, evolving. 
and some, you see some of these in reinforcement learning, but there is much more of this to be done. With many different types of diversity, and I like the one the most. The first one in particular, now, if you think about this in what we have now in Europe, or this immigration problem, it's all about the cultural diversity. We need to know, it, it, the time is over where there was one culture which thought they took in the words like them. And I think we need to do much more of this. I think we as AI, we have a huge potential here. So these, I think, where 2027 AI can go. And if it goes there, I think it's going to be great, personally. And I want to start, I want to close with my own headline, which is, because now we see there was a panel, or there were a talk by Stuart Russell. So all this issue about AI, AI taking over the world, so I want to make this point. So everybody, if you think of the Go players, now Go two weeks, two years, was doing, okay, fine. So far, we as AI had spent a lot of time thinking of machines we can overtake people in doing better. I, I have another option that I hope in 2027 can be where we can work on it. What would be if we take a sex not the fact that machines are better than us, but the fact that machines help us in, better, in doing better, in building better social relations. What do you, if we succeed? If in get, producing each and any person in the world to be available the knowledge of each and any other person in the world, I think it is amazingly powerful. I think the power of, me, of humans and social relations far beyond the power of any machines we can build. I think this is AI. What AI should be. We as AI people should really aim at. And the last point is everybody talks about dangers, the danger of AI. You would agree that uh, the second 2027 goal looks less worrying, but if you think about it, it's actually more risky because now we are talking about getting the machines to run our social relations. And this really is something very risky, but as usual, I think is a, worth, a risk worth taking. Thank you very much. So, so, so I'm maybe going to make the, uh, we were encouraged to be bold and uh, maybe to be foolish. And so I, I'm foolishly and boldly going to try to directly answer the, the, the questions as asked and, and really try to speak broadly about uh, changes in AI rather than only about my uh, own area of expertise, which is mostly around uh, optimization and uh, kind of economic multi-agent systems. Apparently the F button doesn't make it go forward, eh? What do you know? Okay. Uh, so uh, begin by thinking about which technologies will be in widespread use. Uh, I should say uh, all of my remarks are going to be colored by my experience uh, a year or two ago of being on the AI 100 panel, this uh, Stanford a funded initiative that every five years writes a report drawing together a couple dozen uh, AI experts from different areas uh, forecasting what's going to happen in AI. And uh, that was a really interesting opportunity to hear um, the perspectives of a really broad group of people as they thought about these questions. So um, overall, I think in terms of what will be in widespread use by 2027, I, I anticipate we'll still have tailored solutions for specific tasks rather than general intelligences that can be applied to arbitrary tasks. And I think the rule of thumb that, that makes sense to use is to look for prototypes that today work in labs or in narrow deployments and expect them to become uh, more broadly deployed. In, in 10 years, I think we're rarely going to see technologies that don't at all exist today even as prototypes in widespread deployment. So here are some examples. I think we'll see a lot more um, non-text input modalities um, based especially on speech and, and vision. Um, we'll see technologies for consumer modeling used both for uh, recommendation, you know, Netflix kinds of applications and marketing, kind of ad targeting sorts of applications. I think cloud services, just all kinds of sort of smart AI uh, hidden in the cloud, uh, providing services like translation, question answering, or um, mediating outsourcing, you're matching up people with a job to do with the people who uh, can uh, do that job. Uh, there's a lot of hype around transportation. I think we'll see more in uh, automated trucking than in self-driving cars, but I think self-driving cars will be starting to penetrate in 10 years. 
uh, industrial robotics are already important and I think will continue to become more and more important, uh, particularly in um, controlled environments where the financial stakes are high. I think we'll see AI continuing to penetrate all kinds of logic uh, knowledge work. So um, logistics planning applications where again uh, the problems are well defined and the financial stakes are high. Um, certain niche um, areas like radiology and legal research I think are going to be taken over pretty profoundly by AI. Um, other areas like call centers. Uh, and finally I think policing and security are going to um, very heavily skew towards AI in 10 years because um, I think there's a lot of interest in um, greater security. Uh, governments can act quickly and have the resources to deploy these technologies. And really there's a lot that we could do today that if scaled up um, would, would make the world a pretty different place. Uh, you can sort of think of the, uh, the speed camera and traffic sort of analogy applied to all kinds of other avenues of life. In terms of technologies that won't take off as quickly, I think the, the main kinds of barriers that we should watch for are substantial entrenched regulatory regimes that will slow adoption of a technology even if uh, technologically it would be ready to be deployed, uh, or social cultural barriers to adoption that make uh, existing practices um, deeply entrenched, or um, it particularly as Noah mentioned, uh, areas where the barriers are more in hardware than in uh, the AI systems themselves. So some examples of places where I think progress will be slower and we won't see enormous change in 10 years are child care, health care, elder care, and education. I think all of these are high value applications where there, there will be a continual progress, but I don't think, I think the institutions there are too powerful to have really transformative change in 10 years. I don't think we'll see uh, consumer-oriented robots beyond niche applications. And uh, I think there are lots of other problems that are just kind of too hard. So for example, a semantically rich language understanding. In terms of forecast, so, so that's a, you know, which technologies are going to be deployed. Uh, it's sort of harder to think about which research areas are going to be at the forefront in 10 years and, and not yet deployed. That's sort of looking like 20 years ahead to what's going to be deployed. So I thought about, you know, what methodologies might we use to try to do a responsible job of forecasting in, in this kind of way. And I, I thought about two different methodologies. So uh, the first is kind of an economic approach that says, Assume that we're going to be developing technologies in order to satisfy desires that people have. So the you know, capitalist economy basically says that we're going to devote energy into uh, meeting needs that people care about having met. So we should think about what those needs are. Uh, and the second methodology I thought of was to basically presume that areas in AI that are currently successful will continue to build on those successes and then to ask which subsequent questions will be invited by those successes. So in the first vein, uh, what kinds of consumer desires are going to um, be met by technology and, and lead us to, um, to new applications of AI? Uh, the first that we don't talk about all, all that much today, but that I think is going to be a big deal in 10 years, is entertainment. So already the gaming industry is bigger than Hollywood in terms of revenues, but it's still a bit of a niche thing. And I think games are going to become more immersive, uh, a blurrier category that includes more and more disparate things, and uh, they'll involve a larger fraction of the population. And I think uh, AI technologies that, that can cause games to be more responsive and engaging uh, might be a big part of what fuels this transition. Uh, uh, echoing some of the things that uh, Fausto argued, I think one of the main things that people care about in life is making meaningful connections with other people. And so I think technologies that broker, mediate, facilitate connections between people uh, are going to be really important and, and will be socially transformative. Um, you know, ultimately, Facebook, for example, uh, despite being an incredibly important company, uh, it's sort of a glorified web page. It's a, a list of, of posts of things that people did. Imagine if the, the whole kind of modality was, was driven much more fundamentally by AI and uh, you know, various different ways that this might be brought about. Um, people want free time, and so I think we'll continue to see the automation of routine and unpleasant tasks that take up a large amount of people's time, not to displace their labor, but, but rather to give them the freedom to do things that, that m are more valuable to them. And finally, I think education. People care about learning, and so I think we're going to continue to see innovation in the space around education. I previously said I don't think it's going to be a you know, widely transforming the education sector in 10 years, but I do think it'll be a, a really major topic of AI research in 10 years. Uh, secondly, thinking about what would happen if our successes ramified more broadly. So it, 
you know, in this decade, a lot of the recent progress in AI has been driven by improved ways of making predictions from data. So, you know, there's this sort of template of a, a an IJKAI paper over the last decade that says, you know, find some model that's currently built by hand, replace it by a model that is more subtle, more accurate, built from data, and you know, ultimately end up with a better system. And we're, we're kind of applying this template all over the place uh, these days. That, that's where a lot of the kind of industry excitement about AI today comes from. So I think it's a useful thought experiment to wonder what if the technology for building black box models from data worked arbitrarily well? What, what if in 10 years we just pretty much tied a bow around that problem? What then would we still not know how to do? What would we then be focused on trying to do? And uh, I think the thought experiment is maybe more interesting than my answers to it. So I, I, I wanted to dwell a little bit on the thought experiment, but here are some answers that occur to me. Um, even if we have an arbitrarily good black box model for making predictions, we're still interested in, in trying to explain why the model works the way it does or to certify that it's fair with respect to its inputs. We'll be interested in making counterfactual predictions, so reasoning about um, how the world might work in cases where we didn't already observe a lot of data. Um, if we know if we're really able to predict the future accurately, the, the next thing that we're going to want to do is to use those predictions to decide how to act. And so I think as prediction technology matures, we're going to care more and more about optimization and planning. I think often now optimization and planning are not deployed as widely as they might be because we don't have sufficiently digital um, descriptions of the world. And I think successes in ML are going to lead us to these ubiquitous uh, digital descriptions of the world, which will cause uh, existing problems and existing solutions in optimization and planning to be uh, much more important than they are today. Uh, and finally, um, you know, Stuart Russell argued in his uh, talk at the beginning of this conference that AI systems should you know, try to understand what people's goals are and act according to them. You know, anyone who has spent a lot of time thinking about political science or economics or sociology uh, is, is well aware of the fact that people have you know, irreconcilably competing objectives much of the time, not because they're psychopaths who want to hurt each other, but simply because they want different things that are incompatible. And so finding ways to mitigate the fact that people want incompatible things and decide on good courses of actions despite that uh, is, is going to be crucial as we have these rich, powerful systems that are able to act autonomously. And so these are problems like preference aggregation and uh, mechanism design. And the last thing I want to say is about the implications of AI's success more broadly. So first of all, I think uh, regulation is going to become a, a really important topic of study at HKI in 10 years. So it's already clear that many people in society will find AI threatening, and it, it, I think it's just uh, undoubted that uh, policy responses from government are going to be coming. And so some of these policy responses will be ill-informed and will be um, you know, just constructed by bureaucrats who don't really understand AI, but I think shaping these regulations, critiquing them, or responding to them after they've been uh, created is going to be a major job that can be only performed by people who really deeply understand AI. And so I think this conference in this community is going to take a much deeper role in regulation than it does today. Finally, I think we're going to see a shift from trying to build AI systems that can reach human level performance to, building, uh, to, to focusing on problems that require superhuman intelligence. And I think this phrase seems kind of scary, but if you think about it, um, governments, corporations, non-government organizations already exhibit superhuman intelligence in the sense that their behavior is much more sophisticated, complex than that of any individual. And so really we're going to see AIs that sort of act like corporations that are able to you know, make big distributed decisions, pulling together lots of information in ways that individual people can't do. And this is going to lead us to care about improved ways of collective decision making, um, more efficiently allocating and using scarce resources, and addressing important societal challenges like uh, underserved communities, ch climate change, you know, the, the big technical problems that exceed the capabilities of individual people. Thanks for your attention. So one of the disadvantages of coming last is that I will repeat sort of some of what we heard before, and I think very much like, like Kevin, it turns out. So let's get out of the way, you know, what kind of problems we will have successfully tackled by 2027, 
And I don't need to speculate here because others before me have speculated. Kevin talked about the AI and life in 2030 study. So let me briefly mention the survey of the Future of Humanity Institute of the University of Oxford that uh, last year uh, interviewed a number of uh, researchers from NIPS and ICML. And so we see here in this chart what they came up with. So we can look at uh, 2016 here uh, and then at, uh, at, um, at 2027. And we will see that by 2027 they believe that uh, computers will be able to write high school essays, they will be able to explain their own actions in games, they will be able to generate top 40 pop songs and drive trucks, and it's right around the corner that a humanoid robot will win a city race, a 5K city race against the human. And by the way, one of the things that the study found out is that researchers in Asia believe that the speed of progress will be more than twice as high as researchers in North America. So having this out of the way, I want to speculate more what we will see in Ichikai 2027. And so I want to structure the, the discussion by viewing artificial intelligence as the study of agents, but of course there are different kinds of agents. There are rational agents, or those that make good decisions, there are believable agents, those that interact like humans, and there are cognitive agents, those that think like humans. And so what we do today, the majority of the work, a lot of the work that we see here, is on, on rational agents, on making good decisions. But more, more narrowly, uh, what we are doing is we are working on the task level. And if the task changes slightly, we again need human ingenuity to do well on this new task. And at this conference here, we often look at single AI techniques. Now, the optimism that I see here um, comes about, I think, because of a small number of facts. There's some progress in robotics. There's some progress in having lots of data available, better sensing technology, uh, all of us carrying a cell phone, um, all of us using the internet. And a, a really small number of AI technologies, most notably machine learning. And in fact, if we look at these submissions uh, to each guy this year, 49% of the submissions use machine learning as the first keyword. But just like Kevin, uh, I believe that learning models, which is basically what machine learning is doing, has to serve a bigger purpose. And in my mind, this bigger purpose is to make good decisions. So I think in, in 2027, what we will be talking about is no longer big data, but it'll be big decisions. And 49% of the submissions to Ichikai in 2027 will use decision making as the first keyword. Now that fits well with how our favorite textbook, the Russell and Norvig, views artificial intelligence. Because for them, basically, artificial intelligence is all about studying rational agents, and those are agents that make good decisions by optimizing a given objective. So if that's what we are doing, then we need to admit that there are lots of other disciplines that also study how to make good decisions by optimizing a given objective. Um, and I listed some of them here, operations research, decision theory, economics, control theory, a, a bunch of others. And in fact, if you look at the textbook, right, we are integrating some of the techniques. Uh, we are talking here about auctions and game theory, and of course those come from economics. Uh, we are talking about PomniPs and MDPs, and of course those come from operations research, to just give two examples here. Now, what's interesting though is that, uh, you know, we don't have a whole lot of of researchers from these other areas attend each kind. Now we have some interfaces, right? So, so there's uh, EC, electronic commerce, for example, as sort of an interface to economics. The CPI OR in the, in the area of constrained programming as an interface to operations research. Uh, but these interfaces are very narrow. Uh, and then there's sort of this conference algorithmic decision theory that tries to bring all of these researchers together but still needs to demonstrate that it can reliably get researchers from these other disciplines outside of AI to the table. So my prediction for 2027 is that we'll have a big conference on smart decision making and all of us, artificial intelligence researchers, we will be part of it, but so will be researchers from these other disciplines. But we need more progress. Right? We need to go from narrowly intelligent systems to broadly intelligent systems, namely those that perform well on the job level, and that requires the integration of AI techniques and architectures, right? How should these different modules um, interoperate? And that is something that robotics has been, look, 
has, has been looking into for decades now, and, and yet we are still missing sort of good foundations for this, right? Most of these architectures uh, are very hacky. But this is just rational agents, right? So my prediction in 2027 will be that we'll talk less about rational agents. So let's go on to the believable agents here. Let me talk briefly again about this itch guy, because the theme of this itch guy here is AI and autonomy. My belief is that in 2027, we are talking less about autonomous agents, but much, much more about human aware agents, right? With human like interactions, so that we can use gestures and speech. And in fact, I talk every day, almost every day now, uh, to my Amazon Echo, and it works really, really well. So by 2027, we'll talk to, to everything for sure, much earlier already, uh, to your fridge, to your garbage chute, to your elevator, and they will talk back. Yeah, so, so the sci-fi writers like the, Hitch, 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 ah, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy here, um, you know, I, I think this will come true. Now, the thing that I'm not so sure about is cognitive agents, so agents that think like humans. So my feeling is that, that this really was the big dream of AI, right, when, when we started this endeavor way before my time. And if you think about it, my feeling is that we have made far less progress on cognitive agents than on rational agents and believable agents. And so I don't know what to predict here, but by 2027, either no one will talk about cognitive agents any longer, or we have made lots of progress on it, and it'll be the hit of the year. But I don't know which one. So one last prediction here, um, and that is that we see this already here, that we as AI researchers start to feel that we shouldn't just develop AI technology, but also think about how it's being used. Right, we shouldn't leave this to others, uh, what we have done so far. And this is a little bit of a self-serving prediction, um, because as you might know, uh, AAAI and, and ACM uh, are currently working together to create a conference uh, that will study um, artificial intelligence, uh, ethics, and the impact on society, like the responsible use of AI technologies, for example. Uh, so hopefully we'll see this uh, next year already, but my prediction here will be that by 2027 it'll be a big hit and it will bring together AI researchers with politicians, with lawyers, uh, with social scientists and others. Thank you. Okay, so now is your time to ask questions. Uh, you can ask uh, questions to anybody in the panel or a specific person, whatever you want. So get started, get up. Too shy. Come on, who's going to break? You know, it's like when you're in a classroom and nobody speaks up, and then the teacher say, you speak. So I don't want to do that. Oh, there's someone. Okay, perfect, thank you. Okay, yep. How often are you asked at the moment to collaborate with those fields in uh, their research and their publication in the space, including legal and in other areas of scientific research? I think we all had trouble hearing the beginning Sorry, of the question. Sorry, how often are you asked to col collaborate with those fields in the moment? It seems to be a theme across everybody that you um, expect different fields outside of AI to be interacting with AI. Um, researchers to come up with regulations, to come up with um, new ways of AI being used. Is there um, the expected rate of collaboration you would see with those fields now? Maybe, I don't know. I'm not sure, sure I can understand the full answer question, but um, I think that the integration from, you see, each technology, its methodology comes with their own techniques, background knowledge, how do you do it? It takes a lot of work to get into it. So the only way to me to, to put technologies and methodologies together is to concentrate on a concrete problem. I like it very much, the talk yesterday given on health, concrete problems, simple, because when you have a concrete problem, it's easy to check whether it succeeded or, or not. And this, I think, is a, is a fundamental I the decision that the AI should be made, should make. Maybe we should, because I think as a model, most of us, including me, sometimes we get too much trained into technologies in the last theorem, the last algorithm. Why don't we solve the real problems? Why don't we get societal challenge? Then to solve a societal challenge for sure, I know KR is not good enough, but not even deep learning. And these, if we concrete, if we solve concrete problems, this was what I was trying to say with my rare diseases, then regulations will come in. 
Of course, because now we're starting to have an impact on the real world. And then, as I think he said, we'll have just to, to inform people because people don't understand technology as sometimes we don't understand problems. So I, I practice what I preach. Um, so I work quite often with people in other fields. And it, it takes sort of a little bit of understanding of the other field. You don't need to be an expert in this other field. Um, but there are sort of cultural differences often, right? I mean, what, what does another researcher find sexy, for example, right? What kinds of problems can they solve? Um, and so I think you, you need to sort of acquire a core competence in that particular field. Now, it's often not very easy to get to it. Um, but sort of one way of, of doing this on a larger scale, I think, is students. Um, so if we encourage our students not just to take AI classes, uh, but also go out in, into other fields, uh, either fields that have interesting applications, but also fields that might have uh, interesting other technology that can be combined with AI technology and learn something about it so that they become a little bit of an expert on both, uh, then they can build sort of a good interface to these other disciplines. I guess I believe that AI is already transforming the world pretty profoundly and will be doing so even more in 10 years. And I think if that's true, then we won't be able to keep it for ourselves. I, I think many other fields um, will either start to find a convergence between the kinds of things that, that we uh, produce and, and the methodologies that they already have. Uh, I think Sven gave a, a really good list of some of those uh, disciplines on his slide. Um, conversely, I think some other disciplines, um, like the, in the social sciences, for example, will find that um, our work has become an object of study for them. So they'll start to look at the way people interact with the systems that we're building, the ways that some people in society get left behind, the ways that um, you know, things that are designed for one purpose get used for another purpose, legal consequences, and so on. And I think, uh, inevitably, all of these different perspectives are going to get drawn in around our successes. and so. I think we're going to uh, really have no choice but to uh, engage with a much larger uh, group of perspectives. I think that what we can do as AI researchers is to have to create tools that are more accessible to other uh, disciplines. If you take just medicine as example, we create tools for deep learning so they can take pretty easily tools um, and use them for diagnosis of, of illnesses. So once we get better at opening, I mean, uh, uh, creating tools uh, to access our technology better, then we'll be able to collaborate more with uh, other disciplines. Okay, let's get another question. Do you suppose that, um, well, I guess, what, what kind of milestones are needed in order to achieve human level intelligence? And, I mean, if we're talking about 2027 and it's still not even close to where we want like a cognitive agent to be, uh, what kind of milestones do you think will be made on our way towards a cognitive agent by the year 2027? And what kinds of emergent technologies will help us to get there? Who wants to start? Uh, we have to define what human intelligence means because uh, machines are already doing better than humans in many things, right? Go players, whatever. So I take human level intelligence, as I was trying to say, our ability to cope with the unknown, to adapt to the changing world. I think 2027, 20, we have very little hope to get there. But if, uh, if we have a hope to approach that is by, as I said, putting the different technologies together on concrete problems. I think no, no technology can solve the problem by itself. And I think that putting technology together means that this technology will have to change. You see, so you want to do machine learning, then you integrate to KR, but then you integrate to KR. KR gives you more flexibility. KR gives you more explanation of what you're doing. But then KR doesn't ground you in the real world. You do machine learning, deep learning, but then nobody understands what the machine is doing. So how do we do this? We keep pointing this, but we put them together. Putting them together, this means maybe the deep learning cannot run by itself anymore. Now, how do we stop it? How do we ask the KR system to do something? These kind of questions, I'm just talking what I'm working on. So I think be, so. the milestone would be take a concrete problem, real disease problem, whatever, concrete problem, and show robustness to change in the adaptivity. 
Evo ima jansve. I think that the, the chapter structure of Russell and Norvig uh, in 2027 is not going to look radically different than it does today. I think our field has done a pretty good job of decomposing the AI problem into sub-problems, which have largely stood the test of time, and I expect that that's likely to continue. So I think, and I think it's been encouraging in the last couple of years as deep learning and other kinds of recent breakthroughs have you know, enabled new applications, that very often they've done that by empowering other technologies that previously were much less successful, but with, with kind of one new ingredient added, those existing technologies that people have worked on for decades suddenly become much more effective. Uh, the, the fact that reinforcement learning uh, has had you know, dramatically greater successes recently is, is one such example. And I think that that's, that's probably likely to continue. So I, I think it's difficult to predict which breakthroughs will happen first, but I think it, it may be possible to predict that this broad kind of structuring or decomposition of AI into different sub-problems uh, will, will remain robust over time. Yeah, so I think that, that in terms of how we do research, um, at some point in time, we AI researchers decided that we want to have a really deep understanding of algorithms, right? And if you want to, if you want to get this deep understanding of algorithms, then you just need to study one particular class of algorithms and it takes you a lifetime to really understand them. And so I, I think I agree that what we, what we need is broad problems. So we shouldn't be afraid of, of in addition to developing capable algorithms, um, tackle interesting problems. And for me what that means is that uh, I really want to work together with people in robotics. Uh, because people in robotics, you know, have a slightly different culture than people in AI. They want to solve really interesting problems. That, that comes first and foremost. And then exactly how you solve them, well, that's sort of an engineering problem, but they're willing to throw anything at it that looks, looks interesting. Um, but their main objective is to do well on that particular problem. Um, and so my feeling is that uh, if we align a little bit more with robotics researchers, um, and it, it sort of uh, adopt some more of that particular culture that we will make more progress towards a, a broad AI. Okay, another question. Thank you for the uh, great talks. I was uh, very exciting, especially to hear about uh, the ideas of enhancing us as uh, social creatures. Um, the uh, 10 years ago, we didn't have smartphones like we have now. Now we have billions of people that have their faces buried in smartphones all day long. Um, so, I, it, so now suddenly we have people taking AI seriously. There's a huge amount of funding going into it around the world. And uh, that's going to probably change how quickly things change. But. I was just wondering for the panel members, if uh, you believe in the idea of, of progress accelerating and uh, like that Kurzweilian kind of idea and how much um, you tried to imagine that in your, in your modeling or your, your predictions speculation, like, like trying not to, th to look backwards in a more linear way, but trying to if you imagined that things were accelerating. Thank you. Well, I, I always say there's a Hebrew saying that uh, uh, prophecy was given to the fools. So we, I mean, we cannot predict the wild cards. We cannot predict uh, necessarily the breakthroughs. Um, I think that usually our way of research um, and the progress is just linearly going uh, and growing, and from time to time there are indeed s some breakthroughs. I can say specifically again for robotics, um, we're not waiting for the wild cards. Uh, we're doing our research and we're trying to solve the problems as they are now. Uh, if someone will create something like a smartphone uh, that we didn't expect to happen uh, 10 or 20 years ago, then we'll very quickly adapt to that because we're capable of adapting to new technologies. Uh, but we cannot, at this point, we cannot um, base our, our work in the assumption that someone will create something that we don't completely know of today. I think looking at the recent history of AI, it's hard not to be a gradualist. It really seems as though 
we haven't seen a lot of very discontinuous changes. And even the changes that maybe seem kind of discontinuous, like, like the success of deep learning, um, when examined more carefully, really aren't that discontinuous because most of the methods that they leverage have been around for decades. And, and really, many of these breakthroughs are driven more by uh, the availability of hardware, which itself is improving in a very gradual way, kind of hitting an inflection point where something becomes possible to do that's, that's socially interesting, that wasn't possible in the same way before. So I think that the changes that tend to be the more discontinuous are the social impacts, where all of a sudden, you know, something gets good enough or cheap enough or um, you know, sufficiently better than an alternative that something changes about society relatively quickly. But I think the technologies themselves uh, have tended to change quite uh, organically and gradually, and I expect that to continue. Another question? There was a lot of coverage in the news this week about the letter from the 100 folks talking about um, thinking about non-proliferation of some of these technologies in the sense they could be used for cyber war, cyber crime, cyber terrorism. Um, I think the argument was that we can't uh, monitor or enforce certain, uh, say, governments or countries from developing this technology, so the rest of us just have to develop them for our own safety. Do you think uh, in any, I didn't see this in any of your talks today, or some thoughts about what you think the landscape of cyber war, cyber crime, um, cyber terrorism will look like in 10 years? What are our roles and the advances we're doing contributing to that? And what, if anything, can we do to sort of guide the direction of that? And the next war is going to be cyber war. Uh, it, the war uses whatever is technology available. So, and I don't see what we can do for about that ourselves. There is an issue which is, before we were talking about progress, so the, the issue is what we mean by progress. We mean technological progress. As I said correctly, I mean, it's clear that, I mean, in terms of technology, the bounds are there. I mean, like, I'm, I, and the excitability results are there. I mean, the complexity results, they're not going to disappear. But all of a sudden, someone, humans are very good at this. They adapt, they found a new way, a new social use. And this is what they're doing. The big discoveries are social things. I mean, the, the technological scientific boundaries are going to stay there. And, uh, and uh, these things, I think, are going to happen as ISIS came around. As other things, they come around. Someone comes around, wakes up, and comes up with a great idea. They use technology and they push the technology, and now when the problem is there, people will do it. I, but it's part of humans, of course. It's part of humanity, I think. It's part of our nature. Of course, the, the one danger that I see now is that uh, now the risk is much bigger. Now the globality of the phenomenon is much bigger. So we, as a humanity, as a species, we have a much higher risk. I agree. But I don't see any easy. I think it's a fundamental problem. I don't think, I don't have a solution, and I think we should talk more about this. But again, it's not in technology as such. It's in us as social animals, I think. So, so I think Kevin said something that's very true, and that is that we need to make sure that we, as the AI experts, uh, get into a position where people actually ask us, right? Where we sit on, on, on the committees uh, that make decisions, you know, with regard to these kinds of problems. Um, and so, so it's quite amazing that, uh, you know, at this point in time, there are many people out there that think about AI and, and progress in AI and what should and should not be done. And very often these are philosophers, lawyers, uh, politicians, uh, social scientists, and very, very few AI people are involved. And amazingly, it's not necessarily that these groups do not approach us, but it is often that, that whoever they approach turns out to say, look, you know, I'm a researcher, you know, I want to think about these technologies, but I don't want to think about, you know, how they're being used. I think ever since the Second World War and maybe earlier, we've lived in a world where weapons and, and dangerous technologies have existed that the, the barrier to their use is social and political rather than technological. And I think um, AI, some AI technologies may um, come to fall into that category. I think the response to this, I think this is a very important problem that, that we should uh, discuss and be actively involved in, in the conversation about, but I think it's ultimately a, a political and a social question rather than a technological one. I don't think there's, there's a way of deciding that, that certain applications of AI technology can be somehow 
uh, technologically prevented from being thought about. I, I think these things are too porous. But I think it's entirely possible to decide that certain um, uses of uh, AI technology are uh, socially abhorrent and, and that there's a collective global decision uh, not to permit them. You know, we've seen that around nuclear weapons. We've seen that around uh, biological weapons, certain kinds of medical research. I, I think there, there's no reason in principle why this can't happen. Uh, what's necessary is that people understand what it is and that there, there be a broad kind of international, um, internationally shared kind of view that, that this is uh, something that we need to care about. And I think our role as AI experts uh, ought mostly to be to ensure that that conversation is well informed by the facts. Because I think it's too easy for people to see movies about killer robots and, and really misunderstand what the dangers uh, you know, even are, to, to really focus on the wrong things. And I think all of us really have a responsibility to be kind of active in the public sphere to keep the conversation focused on the right things. I think we have reached the end of the time. So thanks a lot to the audience for being here, listening, asking questions, but mostly Let's thank the panelists.